Well, hey guys, and welcome back to Bridge the Gap. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jessica Likewise, and I'm the CEO of Hope Education Services. 12 years ago, I started working with kids with autism. And back when I started working with kids with autism, children would have, people who were adults would have had been born in 1990. Facebook didn't exist yet, obviously, back then. So there was really no unified community of adults with autism who had stories to share or information to share with us as autism professionals. But today, that's not the case. And so I started this show, Bridge the Gap, where adults with autism can come on and can share a little bit about their stories, a little bit about their experience with autism, you know, what assumptions we're making that are right, what assumptions we're making that are wrong, what therapists are doing that are working, and what therapists are doing that are not working. So I'm so excited that this is our fifth week of the show. Um, it's going really well so far. As of now, as the, if you're watching this, as of today, we are officially on three public access local TV channels. It also premieres on YouTube every week at 9 p.m. Um, Eastern time. That's on my channel, getautismanswers.com. And I'm so excited about this show. So tonight I'm bringing on a very special guest. Now, one of the most common questions that I get from parents is can an autism diagnosis level change? And really what does an autism diagnosis level mean? Well, there's been a lot of change even since the time I started working with kids with autism. And this person today, the number you may not be recognizing his diagnosis, but um, I'll explain it and I'll also show you that he's living proof that an autism diagnosis level can change. So this person was diagnosed with a PDD-NOS, that stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder, not otherwise specified. Really long word, right? Today that's just known as autism level two. Um, he was diagnosed when he was three years old. He gained a lot of skills, and by the time he was 10, he was um, re-diagnosed with Asperger's. Now that would be today autism level one. Um, so, you know, living proof that a diagnosis level can change. You know, today he is very, very successful, and he'll share a little bit about how his autism does still affect his life, but he's gone on to do incredible things. He owns and he manages his own fitness studio. It's called Equally Fit. He's a personal trainer, and he works a lot with people with um, special needs, and he's a big believer that everybody has the right to have um, services. Everyone has the right to have pro professionals who are qualified to work with them. And he's a really strong advocate for the community and he has made a really big impact in people's lives. So I'm really excited to welcome Mark Fleming on the call tonight. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Jessica. Awesome, so you told me you were diagnosed with you know, autism, PDD-NOS, which would have been, again today, for parents autism level two. It was, again, changed to Asperger's, and we'll, we'll discuss what you think about the changing of those words, but you know, it was changed to autism level one or Asperger's as you, grew t as you were 10. So any parent who's watching this is gonna wanna know right now, what did you do? What did your parents do between the ages of three and 10 that helped you gain enough skills to get that diagnosis changed? Um, so though that diagnosis really just got me occupational, physical, and speech therapy. And so I was in physical therapy literally until I stopped falling down because um, I fell down literally every day. Um, occupational, uh, really fine motor skills. I could barely open up a doorknob. Um, so not being able to go anywhere by myself, you know, uh, without falling down or opening the door can be um, very difficult. And then uh, my my speech was very monotone, so you couldn't really tell if I was uh, mad, happy, anything. And so I did those until about eight or nine, um, all three of them. And uh, to me, it was kind of normal because my brother was special needs as well. So it, uh, it didn't really affect me thinking that I was different or anything like that. Um, but I did. Uh, uh, the, the, the occupational therapy would say things that, that don't work and stuff like that. Uh, I was I was continually tried to force to write uh, with my fingers a certain way on pencil. Um, and even nowadays, I, I've had um, PhD, ABA people look at my uh, my grip and they're like, "That is the weirdest looking grip I've seen." And I'm like. It works. It, it gets the job done, and so. Um, but for, for those few years, it, it, uh, that's what really helped, and those were my biggest issues. 
Um, I think the reason why I got the Asperger's diagnosis um, later on is that around the age of 10, I moved uh, from Memphis to Tampa, Florida. And uh, it was around grade uh, five. So fifth grade, a lot of social differences and, and body differences coming up and, and everything like that. And with the move, big change, right? The autism is never a good sign. So um, I went back through testing and that's when I got past me. So. Awesome. So you're showing that from three to 10, you made a lot of skills. You said you had a lot of therapy, speech therapy, you know, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Now you said you didn't, you were, you didn't mention ABA. You said to professionals now talk about ABA. And it's interesting because a lot of the adults who I brought on the show and people and myself included has said for years, well, ABA is like the number one way to um, kind of help people with autism. But it's interesting that a lot of people who are on the show who have become very successful didn't receive ABA. You know, so you talked about your OT and your OT like forcing a certain grip. And you were taught that you have to have the pinter grasp. And, you know, you talked about the fact that you did it and it works for you and you still do it. You know, it's interesting because as a child, I actually always held my spoon like this. And until I went to college, I never knew you were supposed to hold your spoon like this. Like no one just ever corrected me. And I did it and it worked for a really long time. And when I got to college, my friends thought it was funny. And so I switched my grip and I mean, I was able to do it pretty easily. But it even felt awkward at first, but then it, it got to be fluent. But I think it's interesting because we look at people with autism or we look at people in general and we want people to do things like a very specific prescribed way. But oftentimes there's really like no rhyme or reason for it being done that way, right? There's really no reason that you have to hold a spoon like or can't hold a spoon like this, like, right? As long as you're able to scoop and pick it up, put it in your mouth or whether it's like this or like that. It's funny some of the social norms, and it's interesting because if you go to different places, sometimes the norms are different. So, you know, you talk about, I think, therapists needing to be sensitive to the fact that people are doing things differently, but if it's working, it doesn't have to be the same. So right. how do you feel about that? No, that, that that's definitely right, because like with me, I didn't find out until later on in life, I have a mirror movement disorder thing. So like the first three fingers, my thumb, my index and middle finger, they kind of connect with my other hand. So if I move those three in the normal grip, I'm actually fatigued more because I'm using actually all six fingers because of that disorder that um, I didn't find out until later in life. And so being, uh, uh, Knowing that now helps me when uh, I'm working with clients that may have to do things slightly different to where um, I can understand and say, hey, this may not be what I was taught, but this is what works with them. And it's still getting the movement that they need in. So why not just let them do that as long as they're not um, hurting themselves or yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting because when I first started working with kids, I was one of those people who was like, it has to be by the book and everything had to be a certain way. And the more time I've spent in the field, the more I've realized that individuals are unique. You know, we have this big word IEP United States, right? The individualized education plan and the idea that every child learns differently and every child is going to have their own education plan customized to them but often it just becomes on paper right we have this like lofty goal of, of customizing people's plan and you know you go on your computer and you select the certain goals that are you know you think appropriate for a child but the reality of it is is that therapists and teachers you know they're going into their practice or they're going into like the classroom and they're teaching every child the same way anyway and you know for me I really try hard when I'm working with children to understand that every child learns differently. So whatever approaches I'm using with one child, I try really hard to not necessarily use that approach with another child. And you know, for me, it's thinking about, okay, does a child respond better to visual stimulus or does a child respond well to auditory stimulus? You know, are they looking at what I'm, I'm doing or are they listening to what I'm saying? And oftentimes people think that for people with autism, most 
people just are more visual, but that's not necessarily true. If a person engages in a lot of visual stereotypy, they might have stronger auditory skills. So I know you talked about before we jumped onto this call and we, we didn't plan a lot, guys, if you're watching this, these are very um, raw and real conversations. And I intentionally don't speak to the people that I interview often um, or much before the show and Mark can kind of, uh, can kind of vouch for that just because I want these conversations to be real. But Mark, you had told me that when I asked you, what's the number one thing you wanted to talk about? You said you wanted to talk about people that are working with this, the special needs population, whether it's autism or Down syndrome or you know, any, any sort of special needs. And they're not necessarily trained or qualified on how to work with people with special needs. And that's certainly true. Um, a lot of times, like, our professionals are really nice and have great intentions, but don't necessarily know what they're doing. Or even ABA therapists might not have the best um, training when they're starting off or one-on-one -on -one aid may not have the best training. You know, from your perspective, how can we incorporate that training of every child being unique and needing a different approach to better serve the community when it comes to working directly with the people who are working with kids? Yeah, um, what I learned, uh, I actually was a behavior assistant before I started uh, my own business. And what I found kind of uh, that helped the best is just learning that um, the ABCs of behavior. Um, it wasn't that I was pushed on, hey, this is how we treat every behavior. It was, hey, this is what you need to look for and stuff like that. So when it comes to um, dealing with different people, you obviously want to ensure that um, what the behavior is about. You don't want to go in and say, oh, well, this child rock, you know, they're, they're just no good. They're, they're, they're hitting for no reason or they're, they're biting for no reason. Um, uh, the, there were numerous instances when I worked uh, ABA to where the child was doing something and there was a very logical reason, um, either health related or, or otherwise, where if you just sat and thought about it for, for a second, you could think, oh yeah, but a lot of times we, we perceive bad behaviors as the individual is bad. And we need to get kind of past that, that. Just because an individual may be lashing out doesn't necessarily mean they know that it's a bad behavior that they're, they're doing, that they can comprehend at our, our own level because in the end, they are fit. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times people say that children with autism don't communicate. And I think the proper way to actually phrase that is oftentimes people with autism initially don't communicate the way other people communicate. But everyone communicates, right? Whether it's an animal or whether it's a person, you know, com everyone communicates and everyone communicates differently. So people with autism, they tend to communicate differently. Behavior is often just communication and every behavior has a specific purpose. So in ABA, we say every behavior in use of the ABCs, it has three parts, the antecedent, meaning what happens before the behavior, the actual behavior, the consequence, meaning what happens after the behavior. Well. Ultimately, the behavior is trying to achieve some specific goal. So if a child's hitting you, you know, chances are the hitting is a form of communication. They might be telling you they're hungry. They might be telling you they're sad. They might be telling you that they're not feeling well. They might be telling you that they want something or that they're not happy with what you're doing. And chances are, oftentimes, it is not that they're trying to be aggressive or they're trying to hit you. It's that they're trying to get their needs met in the best way that they know how to communicate. So I, I like how you talked about that, how the fact that behavior is really just a form of communication. Now, there are times where children just act out, and that's in all children, right? It's even in adults, right? We have road rage sometimes. Um, I live in New Jersey, New Jersey. People in New Jersey have a really hard time driving, <laughs> especially when like something like snow falls out of the sky, like it is happening tonight. So yeah, the road rage can be real, right? And as an adult, I can control my emotions. I don't have the road rage I would... 
um, like to have sometimes, but right, it's because my brain is like neurologically mature because I'm an adult. And you know, children are often expected to act like adults, but they're children. Their brains have literally not developed enough, and this is not only for kids with autism, but it's for all kids to be able to respond the same way that adults respond. They can't, they don't have the impulse control. Their brains are not developed. You know, even babies, like if you take a paper and it's like blue on one side and yellow on the other side, they don't know that it's different colors on different sides because even if you show them both, they think you see what they see because their brains haven't developed that way. You know, and oftentimes people with autism or children with autism specifically, they tend to develop their, their neurological maturation tends to be a little bit different and it tends to happen a little bit slower for some people. So I think it's understanding that you know, children are going to respond like children. They're not going to respond like adults. And being understanding of that and trying to figure out, like you said all the time, what are they trying to do and what are they trying to say? Kids are generally not just bad, right? That's not a word that should ever be in the same sentence as, as kids. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a great point. Now, I kind of want to do a little bit of a pivot. And I want to talk a little bit about how what all parents who are watching this are wondering you run your own business, you know, you have autism, you've accomplished a lot, your diagnosis have changed, like you are basically the model for every parent who right now is like looking at their children and saying, I really hope my child can grow up to be who he wants to be. I really hope that, you know, they're going to be successful. It may happen on their own terms. It may look different than what I thought it would look like. You know, the, the way they're going to go about doing it may be totally different. I just want them to be happy and I want them to be healthy. And I ultimately want to know that you know, when I'm not here one day, they're going to be taking care of themselves. And you have done all of that. So let's talk a little bit about that process. Like, how did you get to the point where, you know, most Americans, they just want to own their own business, but they never do. You're actually doing it. So share with us, how did you get there? Um, well, uh, like, like most people growing up, it was a lot of peer pressure just to do the normal things. Because, um, once I got the Asperger's diagnosis, I didn't know kind of what to think about that because for the most part um, getting that kind of diagnosis was kind of it drew me back because I was popular in elementary school and everything and so from that point forth it was kind of okay I'm just going to meet all the milestones everybody else has. So I drove even though most people around me didn't think I would drive. I went to college out of state. I had numerous people tell me oh, you'll be back before the year's over. Um, and once I got to college, I, it took me a while to figure out the degree I fit in because I wasn't quite sure of, of where I was going. But once I hit that degree, I kind of hit my stride. And um, during the class, one of the professors told me that, hey, if you get this, this bachelor's degree, it's pretty much pointless because you're only uh, over qualified uh, personal training. And so I was like, fine, I'm, I'll end up doing a master's. And you know, the master's school worked uh, a little bit with uh, individuals with disabilities and stuff like that, came back here um, to Tampa and did some ABA and found out that I understood and could work well with individuals with autism and disabilities. And then ended up even a more glorified personal trainer uh, that uh, kind of opened up my own business. And uh, the reason why I kind of did a well, the reason why I did that is that I saw a major gap. I saw individuals uh, that were kids, eight, nine years old, that were getting out of OT, PT, and then at Special Olympics, there were individuals in their 30s and 40s that had the same kind of mus muscular imbalance um, issues. And I look, it, you, you, you look at it and you're like, obviously there's a deficit there. And there's some form of inactivity going on. They're not getting the hard um, kind of uh, work that they need for their bodies. Well, well why is that? What's going on? What, what, what can help with that? And so I looked at my educational background and I was like I know this and after a year working ABA I was like okay I feel good with with every behavior that there is so I don't feel uncomfortable uh, not a lot 
to turning people away at the job. And so I just pretty much got enough equipment to fill up my trunk and I started in home. Um, and it took me a year to fill up my schedule and that's kind of what I was like, okay, I need a studio. And so it's kind of just all these, um, I would say kind of typical milestones that you see. It, it's, it's, it's just stuff I know. Like I know personal training. So I, I know that I don't know certain areas of business that um, some people might know. So I've had to use my uh, connections. I've had numerous uh, battles with my parents over certain things with the business and all that because they're very business savvy and, and I'm just getting started. I, uh, one of the things growing up was the fact that I was told that I was kind of, uh, I didn't like change so much that um, I practiced it in my whole life, you know, to where now if a little change comes around, I'm, I'm able to deal with it a whole lot better. Um, it's still um, a little hard at certain times, but uh, definitely um, uh, growing up with a mentality of, of to show them, you know, um, that I'm gonna do it. And so um, I don't really know how to teach that or, or how to uh, get others to, to do that. And, and I just kind of, uh, especially with my clients, I just show them that, hey, I show up every day, I, I work hard, and, and as long as you do that, whatever you want to do is possible. Yeah, and you know the thing about it is that most people don't have that internal drive. And you know, as someone like myself who's an entrepreneur, I can tell you it's a personality type, right? Like I used to, when most people like were playing with dolls, I was playing stories as a kid. Like I used to like make rocks and shape them into things and sell things. And it's like that personality type and the ability to not listen to naysayers or people that are telling you can't do something. I personally what i've witnessed and felt is like that's something that someone's just almost born with and there's some people who can learn that as a skill and there's some people who will just like take like you said i'm gonna try to prove these people wrong they say i can't do it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it almost like not in spite of them i'm gonna do it because of them and that's something that's i think so amazing and it makes you such an incredible person I feel like though not everybody's born like that and not everyone has that ability naturally to just disregard people who are telling them no. And, you know, people ask me, well, do you like have people that tell you you can't do what you're doing? And I'm like, well, no. And then I thought about it. I'm like, well, I do, but I don't even acknowledge it. It doesn't even register as important to me because I know what I'm doing and I know what my purpose is. But, it, you know, most people don't have that ability. And one of the things I posted on my Instagram recently was that children will listen to what you say about them. So be careful what you say or something like that. And so as a parent, you have to be so careful because you can look at Mark and you can look at the fact that, okay, people told him he wouldn't be able to necessarily go to college and stay out of state. People told him they wouldn't be able to drive and yet he did all those things. But most children or most people are not like that. Most of the time if as a parent or as a teacher, you're telling a child you don't have the ability to go to college, most often they won't go to college. You know, if you tell your ch a child there, you're not going to be able to support yourself financially one day, you're going to be on disability because you have a diagnosis. Most likely that's what's going to happen for them. And there are a few exceptional individuals like Mark who can rise above that all and just be someone amazing and do more than most people only would do really do what most people are only dreaming of. But Mark is the exception to that rule. And I think that it's important that parents hear that because in hearing your story, you know, in the fact that you remember people saying these things, parents have to understand and teachers have to understand that it's not okay to tell anyone that they can't be, do, or have something that they want to do. Now, if your child is, I mean, if, if it wants to be a, you know, professional football player and they weigh like 60 pounds and, or whatever, 120 pounds and they clearly are not a gifted athlete, right? We all have some sort of physical limitations. So within reason, right? But like doing things and achieving dreams these are things that adults should be supporting children and not squashing for children. Because really, who are we as adults to look at a child and tell them that something's not possible? 
you know, if someone turns around and says, I want to be a fire truck, you can tell them, yeah, you know what, when you grow up, I can guarantee you, you can't be a fire truck. But if they want to be a fireman or a firewoman, cheer them on and support them and let them know that they can do that if that's what they want to do. So, you know, Mark, what would you say to parents who are raising children with autism right now, again, who are looking at their child and who maybe truly, they, maybe they really don't believe that their kid is gonna be that person they want them to be. How can they support them in a positive way that'll help them like nurture that growth and also like really support them as a parent in, in helping them to, to see the limitations, but to help them get past them and still be who they wanna be. And again, who they wanna be, not who the parent wants them to be. Um, probably the biggest thing is, is to know uh, that your kids always listen. They're always going to be able to understand what you're saying and to feed off of your energy. So even if you tell them to your, their face, hey, you can do something, but if at night you're at home talking to your husband or wife and you're like, oh, I really don't think you can do that, well, you completely forgot that they probably have super sensory hearing. And they just heard you say that they can do it. And so that can deeply affect them even if you're telling them to their face, hey, you can do this and, and all that. Um, that's probably the biggest thing is, is be aware of what you're saying when you don't think they're aware. Um, because those times they know that you're, you're at your true self. And so they know that then you're just kind of, uh, having a bold face for them and so and a lot of the times I didn't hear any of my kids say stuff like that. Um, I was very fortunate that uh, my sister actually taught me to drive because the parents were too scared to. Um, and so there were there were other opportunities for me in other situations to where um, even if my parents weren't fully supportive I had other support as well, and I gravitated towards those supports instead of um, the naysayers. And so, um, obviously, individuals with disabilities have a, a smaller support system, so you kind of have to be um, almost there everything. And, and you got to, if someone says wants to live alone, but yet they're very bad at at doing a chore or something, well, it's it's never too late to start. And uh, you always are learning. People nowadays, kids, even their typical kids are going off to college not knowing how to do laundry or anything like that. They're learning every single day as well. And so it's not a, a disappointment if you come across something that a child can't do today because you never know tomorrow is a new day. It is a disorder, which means that uh, how they, they develop isn't going to be the typical uh, slope that everybody else has. Now, there may be worse days, there may be better days, but remember that it's always sloping up. Yeah, I mean, every day is different, right? And if you would have told me that a couple of years ago, I would have be making websites and I would have been editing videos and like making logos, I would have told you, no, there's no way I can't do that. I, I do ABA, right? But in order to grow my business online, that's what I have to do. And I think the best analogy for parents is you had no idea how to raise your child when they were born, right? And when they got diagnosed with autism, you also didn't know what to do, but you're figuring it out. And just like you're figuring it out and you're doing well, your child's figuring it out and they're doing well and they're gonna be okay. And you know, I just wanna commend you as a parent if you're watching this, especially if you watch this at the end, because the truth is your child is so lucky to have you. They're so lucky to have someone who, like Mark said, his parents loved him and supported them. And if, if you're on here and you're, you're following my content, you know, whether or not you're getting my weekly blog emails, jumping on my webinars and you know, watching my videos, you're doing it because you love your child and you want them to be and have everything. And I want you to know, and, I, and the reason I bring people on these shows like Mark is because we want you to know it is possible. And I also want to support you so that makes your journey a little easier and make sure everything you know that you need to know you have. 
So, and I'm going to ask Mark for to give a closing word in a minute, but just before I do that, you know, if you are not getting my weekly emails, if you want to get more of these videos, make sure you jump on my email list. You can do that at hopeeducationservices.com. I'm so passionate about just helping families that are affected by autism, bridging the gap between what we think about autism, what autism really is, you know, creating conversations with between people that are neurotypical and have learning differences and that do have autism and really just trying to figure out how can we make everything better for everyone? How can we be better professionals? How can we give kids a better school experience? How can we help parents to have a more fun time parenting their kids? And that's what it's all about. So Mark, if there was like a one sentence takeaway you wanted to give our audience and thank you so much for coming on here today, you know, what would that be? Um. Just keep persevering. Um, there's a better day than you Awesome. And that's a great way to end the show. So thank you guys so much. If you are watching this as a recording, this premieres live on YouTube at 9 p.m. at my channel, Get Eastern Time. It's 9 p.m. Eastern Time. This show does now air on live television. So um, I do know it does premiere on some television shows at 9 p.m. If not, check your local listing as to when it is premiering for you because um, I know it does, it does go on some different times. But thanks again, Mark. Thanks again so much, guys, for coming on. Whether you're watching the recording, you're watching this premiering live, if you're watching this on TV. I really hope that I earned your time tonight and I really hope you found something valuable. Thank you so much.